I want to start our time today with a confession. And I want you guys to know one thing, that I am not a hugger. And guys, I'm not an anti-hugger. Like if you want to try to hug me, give it a shot. I just want you to know I'm an awkward hugger. It just gets really awkward. I've had so many weird experiences. You know, when people try to come in for a frontal hug, you know, and I'm coming in, you know, and if there's something inside of me oftentimes that just flinches a little bit and I flinch and I kind of turn to the side and give them kind of a side hug. They're coming in for a frontal hug and all of a sudden they hit my shoulder and like knocks the wind out of them or just an awkward thing. And they look at me and they're like, Buck, what are you doing? And I'm like, I don't know. They're like, this is so weird. And I'm like, yes, you're right. It is weird. I'm just awkward when it comes to hugging. Or some of my worst hugging experiences are when somebody comes in for a frontal hug and I'm like, okay, I'm going to give it a shot. And we start to get close and all of a sudden there's something inside of me that jumps and I jump and my head goes back like this and they're coming over my shoulder because that's what you do in a frontal hug, right? And all of a sudden we meet face to face and our lips are like two inches apart. It's like, are we going to kiss now? This is weird. And I'm like, I know. It's so strange. And I'm just telling you, I am just an awkward hugger. It's just, it just makes me, I just want to go like, I don't want to hug. And guys, here's the thing. I, if you're a hugger, like I am honestly jealous of you. Like, you know, if you're a natural hugger, somebody who just kind of comes in and you flow and it's like, you know, watching somebody dance who's a good dancer, it's just so natural for them. And you watch them and they're like, wow, you know, it's amazing. For me, I, I wish I could hug that way. In fact, this will kind of date me, but if you guys remember that show called Seinfeld, remember that? And you remember Elaine on Seinfeld and the way she danced and how awkward it was? I mean, that's kind of the way I view myself in terms of hugging. Like, it's just so awkward. And times where I work up enough courage to come and hug somebody, you know, those times I'm like, I'm secure enough. Okay, I'm going to do it. And I come in to hug someone. Oftentimes I'll hug another non-hugger and they get awkward and their shoulder comes and we're about to kiss. And I'm like, this is just, this is just so wrong. So anyways, anyways, I wanted to start our time sharing with you something personal about me and a confession that I am not a hugger. Now, per perhaps you're, you're hearing that and you're like, Buck, where the heck are you going today? <laughs> you know, what does this have to do with church or God or, you know, this whole series called Nothing Else? I mean, well, what's the whole point? And, and the reason I shared that and the reason I started this way is because of this big idea called grace, amazing grace, unearned, unmerited, total forgiveness from God, grace. And I think when it comes to grace, when grace begins to come our way, I think when grace comes at us, it can get awkward. When that unearned, you know, total for forgiveness, this kind of unrestrained, amazing grace from God comes our way and it says, man, you are forgiven, you matter, you are worthy, in spite of what you did last night or last month or last week, all of a sudden, I mean, it comes at us and we were like, oh, we like to hug it. But it just gets awkward and we throw our shoulder at grace or we come back and it's like this awkward kiss with grace. And it just is like, we want to get away sometimes because it's so awkward. We want to go back to the business of earning. And if we can just earn a little bit of that forgiveness, if we can earn our worth, if we can earn our value, if we can make God happy, you know, saying, hey, that's my boy, that's my girl, man, I'm so proud of you. Way to go, I see you. I mean, we just want to get back to the business of earning. And it just gets awkward. And guys, I'm just telling you, if we do that and we can't hug grace back, ooh, wow. That makes Christianity super confusing. In fact, it makes Jesus super confusing. And my hope and my goal today for all of us is that we can learn how to embrace grace, that we can begin to understand that the foundation of Christianity, the foundation of salvation, it's grace that ultimately that we can learn not only to embrace grace, but we can learn how to hug grace back and experience that and understand what that feels like. Because guys, grace perhaps arguably is the most important concept, is the most important term in the entire Bible. And because it's so big and it's so important, I think we gotta understand what it is. We have to ask the question, you know, what is grace? I mean, what is this big concept of grace? And here's the thing I love. 
is that Jesus in the first century, he was so brilliant at coming in and just making things so simple for us. He would take massive, massive concepts and he would just simplify them. And one of the ways he would do this is he would tell multiple stories. He would take a big theological or maybe a big doctrinal concept and he would say, hey, let me help you begin to take a few steps and understand this. And so he'd tell a few stories and we'd go, oh, that's what it's like. Or that's, that's how that concept works in our life. And Jesus was, was renowned for doing this. And because today we're in part two of this series called Nothing Else, where we're saying, hey, nothing else but Jesus, where we've said, hey, in 2021, we could pursue a lot of New Year's resolutions and goals, and those are wonderful. Well, I think you should. But last week we said, what if we just said nothing else but Jesus? What if we thought more about Jesus in 2021? And I said, if you're willing to take that challenge, if you're willing to do that, regardless if you're a Christian or not, and you're willing to think more about Jesus, I think Jesus will reveal more of himself to you. And the more Jesus reveals himself to you, the more irresistible he will be. And I'm just telling you, when you look at Jesus, he would say some of the most, take some of the most profound concepts and just simplify them. In fact, I think if Jesus were here on earth today, I think everybody would follow him on Twitter and TikTok. I really do. Because he was just so authentic. He was just so real. He spoke to the matters of the heart, the things that you and I long for, the things that you and I have questions about. And on one occasion, Jesus is doing that. He's talking to this massive crowd. And, and the, you know, this is one of the things about Jesus. Everywhere Jesus went, there were always big crowds. But the distinctive about Jesus and the crowds that were around Jesus is that the crowds were always mixed. And guys, this is one of the, you know, arguably there's a lot of important things about Jesus, but this is one of the things I really hope you remember. That everywhere Jesus went, the distinctive, the thing that people would never seen in their life, the thing that they had never witnessed is the, you know, Jewish rabbis with a massive crowd of mixed people with, you know, the religious people, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law over here. And then perhaps half or even more than half of the crowd are the non-religious, the, ta the tax collectors the prostitutes, the, the sinners, the people who were okay with not being religious and okay with their sin. And that was such a distinctive. They were always around Jesus and everywhere he went, big crowds and they were always mixed and everybody was scratching their head going like, why is that? What's up with that? In fact, Jesus would do this so often and the crowds were so mixed that Jesus developed a nickname. And we spoke about this last week that Jesus's nickname was called a friend of sinners. Then in the first century, everywhere Jesus went, people went, oh, there he is. There's Jesus, friend of sinners, friend of sinners. I mean, it was such a distinctive about the life of Jesus. And the people who had the biggest issue with this nickname, the people who had the biggest issue with the mixed crowds were the religious folks, were the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, you know, the ones who are doing everything kind of in the self-righteous, you know, all the religious activities correctly. And they would see Jesus in these mixed crowds and they would scratch their heads and they just couldn't get their rule filled, you know, religious minds around this concept that a man from heaven claiming to be the Messiah would spend the majority of his time and efforts and focused on people who were nothing like him. So one day they're seeing this big mixed crowd. They see Jesus and they're like, what's up, Jesus? <laughs> Why are you doing this? Why are you a friend of sinners? And Jesus on this one occasion decides to answer their question. And he gives us such insight into this big concept of grace. And the way he decides to answer the question is he tells three stories, three made up stories to make a point, three stories called parables. A parable is a made up story to really drive home a, an important point in our lives. And the first story he shares to these religious leaders asking the question of what's up Jesus, why would you do all this? Is he shares a story about a shepherd and sheep. And this was very common in the, you know, first century context. Think about, you know, they, these, this was an agrarian culture. There were lots of farmers, you know, their neighbors and friends and family. They were farmers. They had sheep. So everybody, like, you know, could understand this. And so he goes, imagine the shepherd has 100 sheep. Everybody's like, I got, got it, Jesus. And he loses one sheep. And everybody goes, yeah, you know. And Jesus is like, what's he going to do? Everybody goes, he's going to go look for that one sheep. You know, that dumb sheep that's just running away. And even as it runs away, the shepherd runs after it, finally catches it, puts it on his shoulder, brings it back to the 99. Now there's 100 sheep in the fold. And then Jesus perhaps looks at him and says, so what's the shepherd do? Everybody in the crowd, the religious and the non-religious are all with Jesus. They go, oh, he throws a party. Because sheep are valuable. That's a big thing. And Jesus says, yeah, he throws a big old party. And they're looking at Jesus going, what's the point of the story about the sheep and the shepherd? And Jesus says, oh, here's the point. Here's the point. In the same way, there will be a glorious celebration in heaven over the rescue of one lost sinner who repents, 
comes back home and returns to the fold more so than for all the righteous people who never strayed away. Imagine being the religious leader in the crowd. What? You mean all my religious activities, all my obedience, all my giving, all my serving, all my activity? Jesus, you, you, I mean, what? Celebration for them, not me, what? And before they could ask a question, Jesus says, oh, I got a second story. And everybody goes, okay, what's the second story? And he goes, imagine this, ladies. And all the ladies in the crowd are like, what? He's talking to me? Because rabbis never spoke to the women. Rabbis would just oppress the women. Jesus elevated the value of women. I mean, he's so distinct. Ladies, and the whole ladies perk up. Yeah, Jesus. He says, imagine if you had 10 coins and you lost one. And in and, and the first century, it'd be like a, you know, an engagement ring with 10 diamonds, you lose one diamond. Extremely valuable. They're all like, yeah, okay, lost coin. What do you do, ladies? And all of them go, man, we would desperately look for it. Do whatever we could to find it. And then he says, and when you find that lost coin, what are you going to do? And they go, well, we're going to call our girlfriends, get a couple bottles of wine, just hang out, have fun, throw a big old party because the value of that diamond. It's like, exactly. And again, people are going, Jesus, what's the point? And he says, oh, here's the point. That's the way God responds. In other words, Jesus says, guys, I've come from heaven. I have seen this activity. I'm here to explain God. I'm here to show you who God is. I'm here to explain how God sees you. And he says, that's how he sees you. That's how God responds every time one lost sinner repents to turn to him. He says to all of his angels, let's have a joyous celebration for that one who was lost. I have found. Now, if we just hit the pause button right here, you know, as I was reading this this week, I, I thought of two quick observations and they're a little, little bit random, but I think they're somewhat relevant to our discussion today. The first, uh, you know, observation is this. When I read these, I'm like, man, Jesus paints a really clear picture. God has fun. God has a lot of fun. There's a lot of celebrations. There's a lot of parties. I mean, he's getting the angels involved. I mean, these are massive parties. And I thought about that and I thought, man, you know, what's important to know, especially I'm speaking to followers of Jesus. If you're a follower of Jesus, I mean, we should learn from that. We should be able to have fun. We should celebrate. We should actually lighten up a little bit, not take ourselves so seriously and reflect the incredible joy of heaven. And the second observation is this, is I, I thought about something that I have heard so many times in my life and perhaps you've heard in your life, maybe from an uncle or maybe you've said these words. As I thought about this, I thought, you know, I grew up in a home the first 12 years of my life, very non-religious. Um, in fact, I only went to church one time the first 12 years of my life and it was to get baptized because my grandparents guilted my parents saying I was going to hell if I don't get baptized. So, you know, they brought me to church and <laughs> you know, the guy dumped a bunch of water and it was so weird for me. And I was like, this is so odd. And somehow it gets me to heaven. But anyways, that, that was my religious experience the first 12 years of my life. And so my parents were not religious. In fact, my parents were told at an early age they were going to hell and they believed it. And so, you know, they, they would say all the time, and I heard this over and over and over growing up. They would go, man, you know, when it comes to God, how boring. When it comes to heaven, what a drag. I don't want to do that. I want to go to hell and party it up with my friends because hell's where the party's going to be. Hell's where fun is going to be. And I would hear that as a little boy just over and over and over. That got so much airplay in my home. And guys, if you've ever said that, if you've ever heard that, can I just push on you a little bit and just be brutally honest? That is so jacked up. That's so jacked up. Because if anybody knows how to throw an over the top, are you kidding me, party that's like, this is the best thing I've ever been to. It's the creator of the universe who created joy, who created happiness, and who created all kinds of fun. And that's Jesus, and Jesus is leading us somewhere. And he's saying, guys, let me tell you something about heaven. Woo! Boy, I'm telling you, it is joyful. It is a celebration. It's awesome. And so the people in the crowd are like, you're still kind of going, okay, <laughs> scratching our heads a little bit. Jesus, this whole thing about grace, this whole thing about why are you a friend of sinners? I mean, those are a little bit insightful and helpful, but what, what are you getting at? And then Jesus tells a third story, a final parable. And this is such a popular one. This is one, if you've grown up in church, perhaps you've heard about the father and his two sons. One son's rebellious, one son's very religious. Such a great story. And it just really expands our context on this whole idea of grace. And so what I want to do is something a little bit different that I typically don't do. I actually want to read the entire story from Jesus's perspective and give you Jesus's words and just say, here's the story. 
and then I want to make some observations. So this is going to take about five minutes, so hang with me, and let's read this together. And this is such a fascinating story here. So here's what Jesus says. After the story of the sheep, the story of the coin, then he says this. It says, then Jesus said, once there was a father who had two, or with two sons. The younger son came to his father and said, father, don't you think it's time to give me my share of the estate? In other words, dad, could you be dead so I could get my inheritance and do whatever I want to do with the money? Because you got a lot of money. So what's the father do? So the father went ahead and distributed between the two sons their inheritance. Shortly afterward, the younger son packed up his belongings, traveled off to see the world. He's like, man, I'm going to live it up. And he journeyed to a far off land where he soon wasted all he was given in a binge of extravagant and reckless living. With everything spent and nothing left, he grew hungry because there was a severe famine in the land. So he begged a farmer in that country to hire him. The farmer hired him and sent him out to feed the pigs. And I think at this point, because pigs were the, like the worst animal you could possibly imagine in a Jewish context. I think at this point, the Pharisees, the religious leaders kind of smiled and said, yeah, that boy is getting what he deserves. The son was so famished, he was willing even to eat the slop given to the pigs because no one would feed him a thing. Humiliated. The son realized that what he was doing, and, when, and he thought, there are many workers at my father's house who have all the food they want with plenty to spare. They lack nothing. Why am I here dying of hunger, feeding these pigs and eating their slop? I want to go back home to my father's house and I'll say to him, Father, I was wrong. I have sinned against you. Then listen to these words. I'll never again be worthy to be called your son. Can I just make a quick observation? This son had a faulty understanding of his father because your worthiness as a son is not dependent on what you do or don't do. Your worthiness as a son is because you were born as a son. It may be disappointing the choices you make, but your worthiness, the fact that you are a son has nothing to do with what you do or don't do. This son failed to understand this. His worthiness is he was born into it. And this is why Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Because when you're born, you can't lose your sonship. It's who you are. And he had a misunderstanding, so he follows it up. And what he's going to say to his father, he says, please, father, just treat me like one of your employees. That was his thinking. So the young son, with that big speech in his mind, he went off for home. From a long distance away, his father saw him coming, dressed as a beggar, just with all of this yuck all over him. And, and uh, dressed as a beggar. And great compassion swelled up in the heart for his son who was returning home. The father raced out to meet him, swept him up in his heart, hugged him dearly and kissed him all over with, uh, with, uh, over with tender love. And every time I read this for me personally, something I would do with my sons when they were young, I would say, boys, the kiss monster's coming. And I would just grab their face and I'd be like, mm, all over their face. I mean, just have fun with it. And, and when I picture this scene right here, these are, this is a grown son. This is an older father. That's what the father is doing. Just kisses all over. He's just filthy, dirty son. And then Jesus continues and he tells this story. He said, then the son said, father, I was wrong. I've sinned against you. I could never deserve to be called your son. Just let me be. And the father interrupts him and said, son, you're home now. Quit your talking. I'm going to tell you who you are. And then turning to his servants, the father said, quick, bring me the best robe, my very own robe, and I'll place it on his shoulder. Bring me the ring, the seal of sonship, a ring always symbolized. This is who you are. You've always been my son. Bring me the ring and I'll, uh, you know, I'll place it on his finger and then, uh, and I'll, uh, and, and bring me out the best shoes you can find for my son. Let's prepare a great feast and celebrate for my beloved son was once dead but now he's alive. Once he was lost, but now he is found. And everyone celebrated with overflowing joy. And then perhaps Jesus paused, maybe swallowed. And then he said, now, the older son was out working in the field with his brothers when his brother returned. And as he approached the house, he heard the music of the celebration and dancing. He called over one of the servants and asked, what's going on? The servant replied, it's your younger brother. He's returned home and your father is throwing a party to celebrate his homecoming. The older son became angry and refused to go in and celebrate. So his father came out and pleaded with him. 
Come on, son, and enjoy the feast with us. The son said, Father, now you better listen to me. How many years have I worked like a slave for you, performing every duty you've asked as a faithful son? And I never once disobeyed you, but you've never thrown a party for me because of my faithfulness. Never once have you even given me a goat that I could feast on and celebrate with my friends as this son of yours is doing now. Look at him. He comes back after wasting your wealth on prostitutes and reckless living. And here you're throwing a great feast to celebrate for him. The father said, my son, you're always with me, with me by my side. Everything I have is yours to enjoy. It's only right to rejoice and celebrate like this because your brother was once dead and gone, but now he's alive and back with us again. He was lost, but now he's found. It's amazing. Three stories. Three lost things. Three celebrations. It's so clear that Jesus really, really wanted religious people to know about the people they called bad, that God loves bad people and rejoices when they turn to him. And guys, what's important to make an observation here is the story of the prodigal son is really not about the younger son. You know, preachers that do what I do love to make it about the younger son and look at all his sin and the prostitutes and how he treated his father and how disrespectful and they just go on and on and on about the sins and the extravagant sin of the son. That's not the point. That's not the punchline. What Jesus is trying to teach you and to teach me is the extravagant and unrestrained grace of the Father. And yes, repentance is important. And yes, humility is important. And yes, sometimes hitting rock bottom can shed all that pride so you can finally see clearly in life. But the point of the story was not the extravagant sin of the Son. The point of the story was the unrestrained and extravagant grace of the Father that met the extravagant sin of the son. And every time I read this, I just think about, wow, that's who God is. That's how God sees you. That's how God responds. Jesus is saying, you want to see how God responds? In fact, this week as I was reading it, it reminded me of this great quote by Jay Stinger, who's a counselor, who's an author, great thinker. And and I love how he captures this because this kind of brings it home for you and for me what Jesus is getting at. He says, God approaches us for our joy, not due to his disappointment in us. His heart is to exchange beauty for ashes, joy for mourning, and praise for despair. That's who God is. There is no depth of shame that the love of God cannot reach. There is no story he cannot redeem. There is nothing you've ever done in your life that God's extravagant, unrestrained grace cannot reach into and bring restoration to, cannot reach into and redeem in your life. That's the power of grace. And then I love how he finishes this. He says, the paradox, meaning it's confusing at times. The paradox of the gospel is that our failures do not condemn us. They connect us. They connect us to God's amazing grace. Grace which reconciles. Grace which reminds. Grace which gets you back on your feet. And guys, grace is the very thing that I believe leads to repentance. See, repentance is the idea to turn direction, right? You're going this way, you repented. You turn this direction. To repent and turn to God. Because I think one of the things that keeps you and I from repenting, from turning to God in life, is our fear of what's gonna happen. We don't wanna turn to God and see the eyes of wrath. We don't wanna turn to God and see God going, oh, I mean, what the hell have you been doing? I mean, my goodness, and he's going to pay back all and he's going to punish you and oh my gosh. And, I mean, we don't want to turn to God whose eyes are stone cold and there's silence and disappointment, arms crossed, just going, oh, you are such a disappointment. But for far too long, maybe that's what you've thought about God. Maybe that's even what you've been taught on how God's going to respond to you if you turn to him. Jesus is here to kind of shake us up and go, come on. It's good news. It's amazing grace that when you turn to your father, you're not going to be met that way. You're going to be met with compassion. 
You're going to be met with a flood of kisses regardless of what you have or have not done in your past. And see, come on, let's get really honest with one another. You may be here today and maybe you're a religious person. Maybe you're a person who is a follower of Jesus, or maybe you're sitting at home, you're sitting around the table, your kids are around the table, (laughs) and you looked at your kids, and maybe at home you made this comment, you said, kids, don't listen to this preacher too much. He's going too far with this grace thing. He's giving you a license to sin. (laughs) Can I just maybe ruffle your feathers a little bit, push on you, and just say, newsflash, we're already sinning. (laughs) It's already happening. See, Grace is not a license to sin. Grace is what we need to help us with our sin. Grace is the very thing that says, no, 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 no. You're not who you, what you did last night, what you did 10 years ago, what you did 20 years ago. Grace says, no, you're forgiven. Grace says, no, you're redeemed. Grace says, no, you're worthy. Grace says, no, you're my son. You're my daughter. Grace is lavished on us. It's good news. And grace says, oh, you have incredible worth and value. You're beautiful. You have what it takes in spite of everything you have done. This is who you are. It's good news. But the question is this. Let's just be honest. Why is grace so hard to embrace? It's the greatest thing ever. I mean, why is it so awkward to hug back and let it hug us and and absorb and lean into the hug? Why why is it so hard to hug back? Do you know why? Do you know why? Hang with me a second. I think the reason why it's so hard because so many of us hang out in this place. So many of us hang out in worthy land. See, worthy land is like Disneyland. You know, Disneyland's motto, the happiest place on earth. See, when you walk into Worthy Land and you see the outside of Worthy Land, whoo, it's beautiful. I mean, it's so appealing. It pulls to everything inside of you. You're like, wow, this is awesome. Man, I want to go there. I want to be there. It's bright. It's bold. It's attractive. But when you walk inside of Worthy Land, you are stamped with Worthy Land's motto. And do you know what Worthy Land's motto is? Worthy Land's motto is you only get what you deserve. You only get what you deserve. And when you buy the souvenir cup, it's stamped on there too. You only get what you deserve. And as you walk throughout Worthy Land and you look at the park, everything in the park, all the loudspeakers, all the little characters are saying, hey, you only get what you deserve. You better earn it. You better earn it. You better earn it. You better earn it everywhere you go. And when you get inside of Worthy Land, it's not that great. In fact, when you're inside of Worthy Land, the paint is peeling off the walls. The smell is atrocious. It smells like a, you know, middle school gym room and 6th Street just mixed together. I mean, picture that real quick. You're like, oh, oh, terrible, (laughs) you know? You're walking around. The cotton candy machines, which we all love cotton candy, none of them work. And people in Worthy Land, they just don't seem that happy. In fact, people in Worthy Land have these, like, marks on their forehead, And the reason why they have marks on their forehead is because they're scowling constantly and they're pointing their finger and they're saying, kids, don't you run. Don't eat too much popcorn or you're going to pop. They're saying, hey, here's another rule and another rule and another rule. Follow the rules. Hey, listen, rules are important, but when rules begin to trump people, there's an issue with the rules, but they don't care in Worthy Land. It's all about the rules. And the truth is the people in Worthy Land, they want to leave. If they're brutally honest, they want to get out of worthy land. But then they think to themselves, where am I going to go? To nothing land? Nothing land is far more confusing. It creates far more questions than worthy land. So they hang out in worthy land. And when people ask them about worthy land, they smile. And they say, oh, it changed my life. It's amazing. But they never invite people to worthy land. And they hang out there. And next to worthy land, though, is another place. Graceland. Not Elvis' place, but a different place. Graceland. And in Graceland, it's beautiful. In Graceland, people from Worthy Land can see through the fence and they're looking at Graceland going, wow, look at all that. And it's amazing. The rides are massive and it takes a lot of trust to get on the ride like a massive roller coaster. I'm not sure if I'm going to go. But when you get on it, woo, the adventure and the fun, it's real. It's tangible in your life. You get off those roller coasters, man, it was so awesome. And people in, Worthy, or in Graceland, I mean, they're having all kinds of fun because the smell is like sugar all throughout the land. Cotton candy machines, they taste like heavenly cotton candy. It's amazing. And there's joy and there's genuine celebration 
in Graceland. And the people in Worthyland, they're looking at the people in Graceland. They're like, man, I wish I could go. I wish I could be in that place. And the people in Graceland look at the people in Worthyland. And they say, hey, you can come on over. But the people in Worthyland, they're going, no, I, I can't earn that. That's too expensive. That's too much. That's too good to be true. <laughs> and the people in Graceland are like, are you kidding me? It's free. It's free. Come on. Come on over. See, guys, one of the things I hope you take away from this is that did you know Jesus came in the world to bring you to Graceland? He came to grab you and take you out of that worthy land, that awful smelling place of worldly land, trying to somehow earn your forgiveness, earn your worthiness, earn some respect from God. Are you kidding me? You can't do that. That's given to you. It's a gift and it's free. It's free for you and me, but it costs Jesus everything. It cost him nail marks on his wrist. And that's precisely why I believe every single one of you should accept the free gift of grace because not to accept the grace of Jesus and look at Jesus and say, no, no, I've done too much in my past. My sins are too big. You know, I, I can't do this, Jesus. I gotta earn a little bit. Do you know how insulting that is to Jesus? How sad that must make his heart? Because just think about it a second. I mean, if there was somebody in your life that you loved in an extravagant way, if there was someone in your life that you were like, oh my gosh, they mean the world to me. And you worked and worked and worked and sacrificed and sacrificed and sacrificed for years and years and years and finally saved enough money to get the very thing they wanted, to get the very thing that they had talked about for so long. And the day came to where you presented this gift that you'd sacrificed for so long. And they looked at you and they're like, no, nah, no, that's, that's too much. It's too good to be true. It's too expensive. How would you feel? Wouldn't that feel kind of insulting? Wouldn't that be kind of discouraging? What if God feels that way with this incredible free gift for you called grace? Unmerited, unearned, favor of God, total forgiveness. You see what's so cool about grace is grace is a person and grace has a name and the name of grace is Jesus. Jesus' closest friend, the person who spent the maximum amount of time with Jesus on earth during the three-year ministry, his name was John. John chapter one in summary says, Jesus is grace and grace is Jesus. You want to know who grace is? You want to know who's extending a big old hug of grace? His name is Jesus. And John goes on to describe what Jesus has offered to you and to me. In John chapter 1 verse 16, he says, And from him, that's Jesus, we receive grace heaped upon more grace. This was written in Greek. And do you know what this literally means for you and for me? What John's trying to teach us about the good news? It literally means grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. Well, what, did, what about what I did like? Da, 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 da. Yeah, like the father interrupts the son. No, grace upon grace. What about 10 years ago? What about that visit? No, 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 no. Grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. Do, do you know every time I read John 1 16, what comes to my mind? It's a picture. This is what comes to my mind. It's this experience at an ocean. It's an experience with the waves that are relentless. And it doesn't matter what you do. You can't stop them. They're gonna keep coming. You can try to stand in the midst. You can try to build a little sand castle. It's just these waves are relentless. And the waves are saying to you, you are beautiful, you are forgiven, you have what it takes, you are my son, you are worthy, you matter, you are redeemed over and over and over. You can't stop it. It's amazing grace. You know, guys, I, I started this whole discussion with a confession, and I'll end it with the same confession. <laughs> I'm not a hugger. I'm not. <laughs> it just gets awkward. 
But I'll tell you the greatest hug I ever received in my life. It was the best one. It was the one somehow I just soaked into. I just, it just absorbed all in me. The greatest hug of my life happened in 2012. And in 2012, my mom was diagnosed with cancer. The oncologist gave my mom a couple weeks, maybe at most a couple months to live. And so she did what moms do. She got on a plane. She lived in Denver, Colorado, and she came to fly to be with me, my beautiful wife, Jill, and our five boys. And, and we had a week together. And I don't know what happened during that week, but it was, honestly, it was a week of utopia. It, it was the greatest week I've ever spent with my mom. We had so much fun together. We stayed up late together. We ate all kinds of sugar and popcorn together. I mean, we hung out. We played soccer as a big old family together. You know, I gave my mom the most extravagant gift that I could not afford, the brand new iPad, the best iPad you can imagine because I wanted to load it up with all kinds of pictures. I didn't care how much it cost. I, I loaded up with pictures and I wanted us to be able to video conference so the boys could see mama and mama could see the boys and, and we could create that. It was just it was such an awesome week. And remember at the end of that week, I, it was time to, for my mom to go. And, and uh, so we got in the car. I'm driving her to Austin Berkshire Airport. And we get to the airport. We get out. I get my mom's luggage. And we walk into you know, the, the area right before security check-in. There's a couple seats. And I said, Mom, can we sit down? And my mom and I sit down. And, 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 and it, was, it was a feeling as this could be the last time I ever see my mom. And she felt that as well. And, and I looked at my mom and I just said, mom, I, I just need you to know, I'm so sorry. Man, I was a hellion. I created so much heartache for you and dad. I kept you up so many nights. I deceived you so many times. I'm so sorry. And so many things that I began to share with her, she just laughed. She's like, we knew what was going on. We knew what you were doing. And we just laughed with one another. We just connected. And we got up. And my mom whew, went like this. And for whatever reason, everything in me just melted into my mom's arms. And I just wrapped her up and she wrapped me up and her little face is right here. And for five minutes, solid, my mom said two words to me over and over and over. She said, you are. You are a great man. You are my son. You are a great father. You're a fantastic pastor. You are a great husband. You are a faithful man. You are the delight of my heart. And she left. And guys, I share that with you because grace is a person. Grace has a name. His name is Jesus. And Jesus' arms are wide open in spite of whatever you have ever done. And he's got two words for you. You are. That's what grace says. He's got two words to say, you are my son. I will never leave you or forsake you. You are my daughter. You are so beautiful. And the minute we try to interrupt the you are, whoa, 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 whoa. I mean, if you knew, if you knew, if you just, I think Jesus just says, shut up. Just listen to who I am and who you are. You are forgiven. You are redeemed. You are worth it. Your life matters. You have what it takes. You are worth fighting for. And the more you can listen to the you are, the more it frees you from the shackles of your shame of the past. The more it gets you out of the pit of self-condemnation. And the more you can see yourself for who you are through the eyes of Jesus Christ and through the amazing grace that he offers. And so guys, I, I just want to give you a second just a little bit of time to think about hugging grace back. I want you to feel what that feels like. I want you to think about whatever's gone on in your life, and I want you to be willing to take a step and allow the arms of Jesus Christ 
Jesus is grace and grace is Jesus to wrap around you and embrace wherever you're at today and remind you of who you are. So what will we do? Will we enjoy the party or sort of continue running from that? Will we give joy a big hug? Will we choose that? Will we choose to receive? I hope we do. I hope you run to the Father. I hope you hear you are. I hope you have a great week. Thank you for being here.
Thank you for joining us. See you next week. Thank you.